Church. Church. What a blessing it is to be together, is it not? I give thanks to everyone who had a journey that they had to take to get here today. And we never take for granted what, it, what you had to risk and what you had to invest in this moment. And so I'm just grateful that we can be in a worshipful spirit together as gathered by the United Church of Christ, by our officers who invited us here, by our musicians and the production staff, and all of the people who are doing hard work so that we can be together and come out from this experience stronger. Can we give them some thanks? For sure I do. Salt. Where I come from. Salty, the word salty has a very specific meaning. Oh, I hear some words of recognition. That might have been like the Maryland, D.C. conference types. But uh, salty is usually connected to anger. One becomes salty when they've been wronged. You know when you've met a salty person, someone who has that sharpness, who can be a bit difficult. The person you want to avoid after church, because you already know what they're going to say. That's the salty person. Oh, you know them. And how different that might feel from that wonderful savoriness of the text from Matthew, where Jesus is talking about his followers as this sort of flavor-enhancing, delightful force, like we might think of in a perfectly salinated dish. And we all know what it's like to eat something that's unseasoned. Potato salad. Jesus doesn't want us to go unseasoned either in our lives. Our job is to be salty. See, now before, I thought Jesus' use of the term salty was at odds with the salty ascriptions of my youth, but then I thought about it some more. Because even if we go to the Urban Dictionary's definition, who was more salty than Jesus? He was angry all the time, and he was never shy about his disappointments. And with that saltiness, didn't he have tons of flavor? And for so much of my experience in learning about Jesus, I'm going to be honest with you, I confused the cultural norms of myself and the people around me, teaching me about Jesus with the actual behaviors, lessons, and priorities that Jesus preached about. Let me be specific. See, for years, I believed that discipleship meant pleasing my superiors. I was never to be salty, never supposed to show frustration or disappointment. No, 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 don't push, right? Especially because I'm a black woman whose emotions are magnified by a factor of 3,000, it was particularly important to me and for me to cultivate that calm serenity that doesn't put anybody off. And for those of you who've known me for a while, you know how successful I was at this. <laughs> but why would it be asked of me or any of us? I'm, I imagine that most of us are familiar with the trope of the angry black woman, and so many of us make adjustments in whatever trope we find ourselves in in order to be accepted and effective. We keep the peace. But as my colleague, the Reverend Dr. Nichelle Guidry put it, we often keep the peace at the expense of our peace. Culturally, saltiness is only embraced from a select few. But when Jesus said, you 
are the salt of the earth. He was actually talking about all of us salt. Light. I thought this was about being glossy. But gloss is about refracting or reflecting something else without originality or authenticity. Let me give an example. I confess to having believed from time to time that the mark of satisfying my God was somehow going to be reflected in the number of followers I had. If God were happy with my ministry, I would serve a certain program-sized church with, with congregants who never complained. <laughs> and bosses, because I wouldn't be in charge, bosses whose brilliance I would highlight and compliment, but never outshine. So many of us are taught to be gloss, to refract someone else's power so that they shine while our lights stay hidden. And if you've ever experienced this, can I get an amen? But I think Jesus is asking something else of us instead. For us to produce the kind of light that Jesus describes, we need some heat, some internal fuel that sets off a reaction that allows us to be seen. Shining our lights, folks, means that we are not invisible. To be salt and to be light means that Jesus' intention is that we are meant to be seen and heard and children too. And any dynamic, any force that seeks to silence us or erase us is actually a force against God. You were born to be salt and light. But salt and light have to be protected. Remember, Jesus points out that salt isn't doing its job if it's been trampled down. Salt that has been tread all over cannot be salty anymore, he says. It needs protection. But the salty, especially the ones who are courageous in their witness and sharp with their words, gain enemies quickly. If you are being salt, then you are guaranteed to be opposed. I'm sorry, it's just the truth. And the more your opponents have to lose from your saltiness, the more they will try to take that saltiness away from you. And it could get dangerous. Being trampled underfoot could even be deadly. And they tried to do this to Jesus. But should they have been able to, is my question. So work with me here, because Jesus lived so that we might live, right? Jesus gave the example so that we could follow him, but he also gave the instruction so that if we were paying close enough attention, others would not have to go through what he did. But as history b betrays to us, many others have. I think of Stephen Martyr, who because, as I quote the Bible, they couldn't withstand the wisdom with which he spoke. Stephen was slandered and seized and wrongfully convicted before they killed him. I think of my friend, civil rights leader Kathleen Cleaver, who had to flee this very country for a decade to avoid persecution because of her activism. I think of Dr. King, and the 40 other, as we call them, civil rights martyrs who were taken down for standing up, and here you see my Lynn's beautiful memorial to them at the Southern Poverty Law Center. But there are so many others, and I feel ashamed that I don't know all their names. Where was their protection? Here's the challenge. Cultural entrenchment here in the United States 
allows for us to turn away. There are mechanisms that actually require us to. And then the salty still get trampled underfoot while the rest of us stand by or trample too and watch because we just can't figure out how to imagine or try another way. It can be scary to oppose systems that prefer the silence of our prophets. But unfortunately, if we don't oppose them, then we align ourselves with power structures that aren't in alignment with God. And what's the solution? Well, look, we aren't trampled unless the people around us, we are not trampled unless the people around us let that happen. We wouldn't know this violence if there weren't something about this that we tolerate Jesus' as followers in the crowds back in his day were legion, y'all. They allowed for his suffering because they couldn't imagine, summon, and plan a better way of protecting him. Ask me how I know. But here's the thing. If we want salt to be salt and light to be light all over the world, then we had better protect it, y'all. Every one of us was born to be seen and heard, and this will not work with that strategic, consistent, cross-generational, transnational, pro-God's creation, gender-expansive, global, communal protection. Back home in New York City, the organization I co-chair, the New Sanctuary Coalition, is run by a man named Ravi Rugbeer. You may see his face on the screen at some point. And a little while ago at a re routine check-in with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, my best friends, they decided to cuff him, detain him, and deport him back to Trinidad immediately. They told my friend, my brother in the struggle for the past 10 years, Uncle Ravi to my daughter. They told him abruptly that his time in this country he loves and serves had come to an end. And after a protracted and brilliant legal fight. A federal court ruled that Ravi was being deported literally as an act of retaliation against his activism and his outspoken advocacy. And the word that the court used was silencing. They wanted to silence him because Ravi's light is still right now too bright for ice and they tried to disappear him, another word used by the judges in court. But when Ravi was about to be deported, I want you to understand something. The people showed up. We weren't going to let him be silenced or trampled or cast aside or intimidated or deterred, and I would contend that Jesus himself is counting on Ravi to be salt and light while counting on us to be sure that Ravi and people like him can keep on keeping on. Even I have faced a little bit of this myself. Some of you know my story or something of my story, but with a number of many other clergy, some who are in the room right now, when we learned about the migrant caravan, we said, we're going to do what we can to take our skills and our gifts down to the southern border as people are coming, facing death at home and Lord knows what on the way. And maybe here in the States where we know that we have rights and protections for them, we can offer something better. So we set up something called the Sanctuary Caravan and went down and brought tons of y'all, thank you if you came, and so many others from all kinds of other denominations to do a pro se clinic. Pro se meaning for yourself, where we taught people how to argue for themselves 
because we don't have enough immigration lawyers to make this work. And because of my work and because I tend to be out in front of this, I wound up on a list called Operation Secure Line, a secret political hit list that we learned about because of a whistleblower, where literally within government documents, as I present my passport to the people who take it when I try to cross the border, they see crosshairs across my face. And I'm just a pastor who went down and prayed with people, with some of y'all, did some of, officiated some weddings for people who in their home countries didn't have enough money to make it work. And because of that work, and because I spoke the truth about what the true crisis, which is manufactured at the border was, as opposed to letting the government under its current ways define that, I wound up on their political hit list. And so facing this with many other people, they look to monitor and to honor and to define the truth and to stop us from doing the same. But they won't be stopping me and they won't be stopping any of us because the world is counting on each of us to protect our light. And it just makes me think, when will Christians actually start protecting light? Like, just even go back to the biblical narrative. What would have happened if Peter hadn't denied Jesus? Why were the women and the beloved disciple the only ones at the cross? Imagine if they had stood up for Jesus when they came to arrest him. What if after they killed him, the streets were filled with Jesus' followers. Why did he have to die so alone? Just remember this. Burning bright requires a whole lot of fuel. To be light, we need kindling. And being light means shining for others. But if we don't shine for ourselves, it can't last, and it might wind up being somebody else's loss. Salt and light. I believe that you have already been given the revelation of what it takes for you to be salt and light in this particular time, in your particular circumstances. And chances are that for you, like me, that requires some pretty big changes in your life. And a piece of it is in your control. But the rest of it, though, it's about us. It's the collective we. The we that will offer the protection so that no one will ever be trampled underfoot or crucified or deported to their torture and death or gunned down in their schools or on their stoops or shamed for who they are and who they love or shackled for their body's labor or silenced or erased or eradicated because their call was too inconvenient to hegemonic power. Here in the UCC, we have 248 sanctuary and immigrant welcoming congregations. A number that has grown so much in the past biennium thanks to the very hard of work of a lot of people, especially Noel Anderson, who I hadn't planned on calling out, but I should. Meanwhile, there are tens of thousands of migrants right now who are being held in internment camps and prisons, most of whom who are, by the way, in the country legally, though from my perspective that part doesn't matter, but it may for some of you. There are 20 women right now, trans women, who are being held at Cibola Prison in New Mexico. Who's here from New Mexico? You're close. And what we're trying to do right now is to figure out how we take these 20 trans women who are being held in solitary confinement and get them placed in the communities where they can go. And the only way that the Santa Fe Dreamers Project has been able to place them effectively is to have sponsors. 
What we are hoping for is to find for people like these trans women whose lives are on the line, for people like others who are being held for no reason, honestly, except to create a spectacle, and the churches of the world, including and especially led by the United Church of Christ, to stand up and say, we will vouch for these people. We will take them. We will give them the resources. We will help them. We will not feel helpless. 248 congregations is wonderful, and it is also insufficient. efficient And I call on each of us if we are not counted in that number, to work to triple it so that we, or even more, so that we are a thousand immigrant and welcoming communities by the end of the summer to sponsor people to get out of these camps. We are not helpless. And it is our Christian ob obligation to do this work because we refuse to have history look back on us and to say, where were we when evil tried to stomp out our neighbor's light? The collective we, the God-following, Jesus-believing we, sees the light God shines on all of this and connects to the possibilities of change and plans for it and then commits our lives to it. And so I close with this. Jesus talked about lights being put under bushels. But as I just try to picture that, I get a little bit excited. Because the flame that burns under a basket has kindling. And what I would like to suggest is that whenever they try to cover your light, I encourage us all to figure out how to take that aggression against us and turn it around and burn. Burn with the Holy Spirit. Burn like the fire of Pentecost. Burn with the power of God, with a fire that burns but shall not consume you. In Jesus' name, amen.